So last time I talked about, um, I introduced this uh, finite free convolution. And just to remind you, um, if I have determinant of so A and B uh, let's say real and symmetric. Uh, right, so uh, we got to a convolution of polynomials, which represented the expected value of the determinant over um, A plus B, where B is rotated by a random uh, unitary matrix. Um, and then I should know that this is an expectation over polynomials, right? So you're adding a bunch of polynomials together. And so in particular, there's no reason why this would even necessarily have real roots, let alone make any sense whatsoever. But it does, and it uh, equals this thing. Um, and I should say that the reason um, why we are interested in these things is that we want to do some sort of probabilistic method on um, matrices to try and understand their spectra. Um, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but first, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes um, going over some of the properties of these convolutions. Um, so in particular, I can rewrite the formula above as uh, so P plus MQ as a function of x plus y is M factorial Q D minus I Y. So if you uh sorry, this should be an M for uh P Q degree less than or equal to M. So I can define this for general polynomials. Um, and if you multiply this out, you see that this is a function of x plus y. And um, so that is the convolution of with x plus y plugged in. 
Um, and the thing that you can get uh, from this form is that um, this convolution commutes with respect to the differential operators. So in particular, here's a lemma. D to the k of p plus m q equals d to the k p plus m q equals uh, p plus m d to the k q and uh, this depends on p and q being a uh, degree less than or equal to m. Um, but this gives a very nice way of, um, of computing these things, uh, particularly because you have uh, that p plus m x to the m equals p. So in general, if I want to compute something like this, what I need to do is find some uh, differential operator, which when I apply it to x to the m gives me p, and then I find another differential operator, which when I apply it to x to the m gives me q. I can factor those both out. I multiply those as uh, differential operators, and then I can apply it to x to the m and get what the answer is. Uh, so in particular, This allows you to compute things like, uh, so let's let P be polynomials with, uh, say, real rooted with sum over the with roots. I, the sum over Ri should be degree m. Then if you add up uh, P Evaluate it at n times x. Uh, this equals n to the n uh, x minus mu. Ah, this goes to x minus mu to the m. So this is somewhat of a law of large numbers. If you keep adding up the same polynomial over and over again, n times, and then you plug in n times x, which is essentially dividing the roots by n, then this thing converges to something which has all roots which are mu. Um, and you can get a similar central limit theorem, which says that uh, Where root of nx is hm, uh, where here the uh, sum over ri is 0, sum over ri squared over m is sigma squared. Uh, the polynomial itself converges to this. So the coefficients of the polynomial. As, as something goes to, to as, as n goes to infinity. But n is, the, is n is on the right hand side. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, right, so you need some sort of normalist. So I think n to the n over here, probably. Uh, so. What I can say is that the roots of this in 
in roots. That's x minus mu. Uh, depending on how you do this, you'll get some weird constant in front. Uh, and the same thing happens here. You guess this is. Uh, HM are Hermite polynomials. And here I need to be careful and tell you what a Hermite polynomial is because there are two different kinds. And for me, my Hermite polynomials will be the ones that are orthogonal with respect to the Gaussian. So. Some people have picked the Hermite polynomials to be orthogonal with respect to e to the minus x squared. Um, for our purposes, it seems to make more sense to uh, have it be orthogonal to the Gaussian since we're doing probabilistic things anyway. OK, and if you had any sort of um, experience with random matrices, the fact that the Hermite polynomials show up should maybe not be a surprise because the Hermite polynomials, when you uh, look at them asymptotically, their root distribution converges to the semicircle distribution. And the semicircle distribution is exactly what you would expect uh, as the, because that's sort of the Gaussian of, of free uh, probability. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, yes. So, yeah, there's also a normalization there. So, um, so then uh, you might want to ask, how do you characterize these Gaussians? Um, and in fact, they act very nicely with respect to um, concept of entropy. So, um, so for normal, for free random variables, um, you have a free entropy, which is chi of A is integral natural log of u minus v d mu a of u d mu a of v. And there's a finite free entropy which is p uh, 1 over 1. Um, natural log of ri minus rj. And it's a classical theorem of uh, Segu, which says that uh, this entropy function, this uh, logarithmic potential function, is maximized by exactly these uh, Hermite polynomials. So 
all of the things that you sort of want to happen in a probability space are happening here. Um, and this is minus infinity if uh, h has a double root. And that turns out to be sort of equivalent to the, the free probability definition um, when uh, your distribution here has an atom then which your entropy ends up becoming uh, minus infinity. Okay, so I wanted to talk about, so I keep using the word free and I wanted to uh, mention to what extent this is freeness. So first of all, let me mention that this actually makes sense. So uh, let me say that A and B are M free if So here I'm averaging over all possible rotations. And I'm going to say that A and B are free if averaging over all possible rotations is the same as just adding the two, adding the two matrices together. Okay, And it is a very um, useful theorem of Helton and Binnikov. on real stable polynomials, which allows us to say something even stronger. Um, so for all A and B, there exists an R such that determinant of Xi minus Ya minus Z R transpose B R is uh, oh, wow. So not only does such a rotation always exist, which allows you to treat these uh, expected polynomials as if you were just adding two things together. Uh, such a polynomial, oh, sorry, there should be a y. Let me see here. You can do it such that it's true always on a matrix pencil as well. Um, okay, and if you remember what I said from yesterday, that uh, two random variable or two matrices, well, two operators can only be free if they exist in infinite dimensions or if one of them is the identity, a multiple of the identity. So already this should tell you that what's happening here is weaker than freedom. Okay, so we're getting certainly weaker. Constraint than true freeness. And well, I'll claim that's a good thing. But So in order to do a comparison, let me introduce the multiplicative convolution. So this is defined as uh, P X M Q, which is sum over I minus one to the I I Q I. So uh, the normal Hadamard product normalized by an M choose I, which is the as you might expect, what happens if you do something like this? Um, 
And what ends up happening is that you can also show that there, for a given A and B, there's always a rotation which allows uh, this to be done by an actual matrix. So there exists rotation such that uh, determinant of x, i minus a, r transpose b, r equals this. And one sufficient condition for this is that, uh, so it turns out that a and B work here if A and B inverse are M free. So what you have in the normal free case is that when you have two random operators A and B, if they're free from each other, then essentially the entire algebra generated from A is free from the entire algebra generated from B. That turns out to be an extremely strong constraint. So essentially what's happening here is that we're allowing pieces of A to be, well, we're allowing A to be sort of free from B without forcing, or in an additive way, without forcing it to be free in a multiplicative way. In the same way we're not forcing A squared to be free from B, or B squared and all of these other uh, combinations of them. Uh, so the hope is that you can apply this to more situations where you really don't have full freedom, um, but, uh, but you still want to be able to do something similar to this. Okay? So, let me talk about how this behaves with respect to bounding things. So if you remember, we had this inequality, or we had this equality in the free case, uh, R A U A affinity plus R U B infinity plus R U A plus U B infinity. This was really actually the definition of what the normal free convolution is. And we adapted that to be R U A M plus R U B M R U A in the case that A and B were uh, m by m matrices, and the inequality that you have is this. And I claim this is actually the inequality that you want. Um, uh, and this is uh, with equality if and only if a or B is a multiple of the identity. OK, so like I said, when A or B is a multiple of the identity, then A and B are actually truly free from each other. So you would expect this to be an equality as well as this to be an equality. When they're not, then this is strictly smaller than this. And I claim that this is, tells you an inequality about roots of polynomials. So let me show you. So remember that G in, so let's let G inverse of mu of A of X be W. This means that G mu A of W equals X. Uh, but in this case, G mu A of W is P prime of W of 
over P of W times M, where P is the characteristic polynomial of A. Uh, so what this implies is that P of W minus 1 over mx p prime of w equals 0, which means that max root of 1 minus 1 over mx p is w. OK, so you can turn this statement into a statement about what the maximum root of some polynomial is. And what this statement says is that the maximum root of this polynomial is actually smaller than what, you, what the maximum root of the polynomial would be if they were actually totally free. So if what you're trying to do is to bound the roots or bound the uh, maximum eigenvalue of the operator that you're dealing with, this tells you that essentially in the finite case, you should expect to do better than any estimate that you could get in the uh, free case. Or I should say at least as good. So how do we use these things? Well, the idea that we want to do is, that, is one from probabilistic combinatorics. So historically, the use was sort of our reason for even considering these things in the first place. Everything I did yesterday sort of came afterwards as a way to explain where on earth these things came from. Um, but from an application point of view, uh, these actually were invented for the application. Um, so in probabilistic combinatorics, you have statements like if I have you know, numbers, real numbers, x1 through xn and sum over ai xi equals some t, where the sum over the ai is 1. This implies there exists an xi which is less than t, and there exists an xi which is greater than t equal to. Right? So if you have a bunch of numbers which average to t, then one of them has to be bigger, at least as big, and, the, and another one has to be at least as small. Right? That's sort of the main uh, theorem of probabilistic combinatorics. Um, and we would like to say the same thing about matrices. Right? We'd like to say something like, you know, if I have a1 through an, and I know that lambda k of the sum of the ai ai's is equal to some r. This implies that there exists an ai such that lambda k of ai is less than or equal to r. There exists an ai such that lambda k of ai greater than or equal to r. And as much as we would like to say that, that's problematic because it's not true. Okay, and there's very simple examples to this. Let a1 be 1, 0, 0, 0. a2, 0, 0, 0, 1. So then there. Averages one half, one half, and clearly neither, you know, the largest eigenvalue of this is not larger than this, and it's also not larger than this. So, wanting to do something like this is um, sort of unproductive because it's not true. But my claim is that something like this is true sometimes with polynomials. So while it might seem bizarre to 
take your operators and turn them into polynomials because you're actually losing information, right? You're losing your operator, you're losing the rotation of your operators. So when you add them together, you actually have less idea of what's happening. Um, you can actually gain from using polynomials because you can do something like this that has this kind of property. Okay, and to show you this, let me define what is called a common interlacer. So we say P and Q, well, flexion PI have a common interlacer if there exists a Q, these are all degree M of degree M minus one, such that lambda K One pi pi and all k plus So essentially, in between every this Q, sort of the roots of Q separate the roots of every single one of the PIs. So what does the picture look like? If this is your common interlacer, Q, it means that all of your PIs, so Q separates the real line into M different intervals. And all of your PIs have to have exactly one root in each of those intervals. Okay? So it has to look something like this and this. I don't know how I ended up being positive and the negative, but. Hmm? Uh, sorry, yeah, this is the problem. If you have two polynomials, then they always have a common interlacer. No. So, in particular, for instance, this and this don't have a common interlacer. Uh, right? So, if you have two polynomials, uh, yes. So, so, so this is a this is a strict generalization of interlacing zeros. Uh, correct. So, what it means is that pairwise, all of them have sort of inter, uh, interlacing zeros. So, there are, are definitely. Theorems which show that this is true when, well, so when the set A is big enough, right? So there are, in particular, Mark Rulison has inequalities which show that these things are, with high probability, very close to this um, if the size of the set is big enough. But we, for our purposes, we need both a smaller set and we're actually trying to consider situations where the theorem is not true with high probability. It's only true with low probability. Or at least that's where the uh, utility of what we're doing comes. OK, and my claim is, is that if pi, our degree m, monic polynomials, the fact that they're monic is not really that Important, but they need to have the same uh, sign of their first coefficient. Otherwise, you get cancellations that you don't want. Uh, and they have a common interlacer. Uh, 
Um, so I should go back a second and say, somebody really should have mentioned, well, let me just say, sum over AI PI is, so there exists PS. Okay, so the first thing that you should think is, does this even make sense as a statement? I mean, I'm adding up a bunch of polynomials. Can I even tell you for sure that the roots of this new polynomial are even real? Or am I saying something like, you know, this guy has a root which is less than or equal to, you know, some imaginary number, complex number? Uh, it turns out that having the common interlacer does guarantee that this polynomial is real rooted. And in particular, it also tells you that the, when you know one of the roots, you can assert that one of the polynomials that went into your collection has a larger root of that type, and one of them has a smaller root. And the proof is very easy. So let's uh, let... Um, This is what your polynomials look like. So the, here's a root of q, the common interlacer. And here's an, the other root of q, which is a common interlacer. So all of the polynomials have a root somewhere in this interval. And they have exactly one root inside this interval. And in particular, they have at the beginning, they're all positive. And at the end, they're all negative. So when you add them up, they're positive here and negative here. And so somewhere in the middle, they have to be 0. Okay, so that means that the sum or the, any convex combination has to have a root in here. And furthermore, at that place, you can then go back to what we said was sort of the core theorem of probabilistic combinatorics. You have a bunch of numbers which are adding up which the convex combination of them are adding up to zero, and so one of them has to be less than or equal to zero, which corresponds to having a smaller kth root, and one of them has to be greater than or equal to zero, which corresponds to have a, having a, an at least as big large root, uh, kth root. Okay, so does that make sense? Okay, so let me apply this. So the punchline is any time that you can get these sorts of uh, common interlacers, then you can do things uh, exactly like I was trying to do, where you can take some average and then assert that one of the things is at least as good as your average and, the other, and something else is at least as bad as your average. Um, so for example, let's let v1, vm be vectors. Then the polynomials uh, PI, which is uh, Star uh, pi, Ugh. pi, pi star, uh, all have a common interlacer. This is true for all vectors. So if you now let all of the vi have size uh, 1 over m, or this should be a different M. Um, this N. 
uh, then what this says is that anytime you add some new vector, then, or, so there's always exists some vector in your set, which when you add it to this, either is better than what would happen if you added the average of all of them, or the free version of them, and there's one which is better than, and there's one which is worse than if you had added the free version. So, uh, in particular, if I also assume some vi vi transpose equals the identity, then it turns out that uh, the sum over the pi is equal to this free convolution of, so if you started with determinant of xi minus a is q, then the sum over i determinant of x i minus a minus v i v i star is q plus m x to the m minus 1 times x minus 1 over n. This should be an n here. So when they add up to the identity, this is sort of a quadrature for doing an integral over the entire orthonormal set. So you get the same polynomial, which would happen if you had added this, which is the, what, the characteristic polynomial of this, because it only has one root, and it has a root of size 1 over n. Uh, so in particular, you can assert that this has a better, one of these has a better root than this, and one of them has a worse kth root than this. So in particular, this leads to the um, following theorem. Uh, so there exists v1 through vk, subset of these v1 through vn. Uh, such that lambda k of the sum over vi vi star is greater than or equal to lambda k of, let's call it r plus m r. times where this polynomial is r of x. And then if you go and uh, do the math that comes from this inequality that I mentioned before, you get that this is greater than or equal to 1 minus square root of k over m times m over squared m over n. And this is what's known as restricted invertibility. It's a subcase of a theorem of Borgan and Safriri. Invertibility. Which says that if you have a collection of vectors, you can pick some k subset of them such that they act with themselves like they're almost orthonormal. Um, and this sort of pops right out of all of this algebra by noting that you know, adding a vector is essentially like adding a free vector. And so you can bound any of the roots by whatever the root of this uh, free sum, finite free sum of these polynomials are. Uh, 
Um, okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that this would be all nice and good if you know everywhere you looked you had common interlacers for things, but in fact that almost is never the case. This is somewhat of a rarity when you can actually have a common interlacer for everything. So in order to actually apply this in most situations, you need uh, something, you need to be a little bit more clever. And that leads to what we call an interlacing family. Uh, so what is an interlacing family? Let me draw it so you have this collection PI. And they're going to be leaves in your tree. And the idea is that if you had one thing that commonly interlaced all of them, then you would be fine. You would be able to you know, take any convex combination of them and then assert that one of these is at least as good and another one is at least as bad as whatever that convex combination is. But you don't always have these common interlacers, so what you instead do is you try to group these guys together. Let's see. Like this. Such that these guys have a common interlacer and these guys have a common interlacer. These guys have a common interlacer. And you form some new convex combination of, of in them individually. And then you look at convex combinations of these. And then finally, convex combinations of these. Say. And if at every level, well, this has no anything. So if at every level you have common interlacing, then this forms what we call an interlacing family. Okay? And the idea is that if collection of PI form interlacing family, then the uh, conclusion that we had before is true. So then there exists an S and a T such that lambda K of PS is less than or equal to lambda K of the expected value of the PI is less than or equal to lambda K of the PT. And the proof is very simple. You start at the top with this convex polynomial over all of them, and you say, well, since everything below me has a common interlacer, that means one of these polynomials has a better kth root and one of them has a worse kth root. So if what I'm looking for is a worse kth root, then I pick whichever polynomial that is. And then I look at its children and say, well, they have a common interlacer. So one of them has a worse kth root than I do, so pick him. All of my children have a common interlacer, so they have, one of them has a kth worse root than I do. So if you follow it up the tree, this guy has a, a, kth, a worse kth root than the convex combination does. And this is where we'll derive uh, a lot of the power of what uh, we're trying to do. And um, tomorrow, in particular, I'll show you how to um, use this to uh, prove spectral bounds on uh, graph Laplacians um, that really don't happen. I mean, so you, I, that are hard to get any other way, particularly because it seems that the case of the free sum is like at the very edge of the probability spectrum. So essentially, uh, here is what the probabilities can possibly be, and here is what the, the free sum is. 
And so anything that you say with high probability ends up being sort of you know, slightly bigger than what, what the worst case scenario is. And we would like to be able to beat the worst case scenario, or what is the, the asymptotic worst case scenario. So that's what I'll, I'll do tomorrow. <laughs>